conference today. Dr. Lee is the Vice Chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology, focusing on experimental therapeutics at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where she also serves as the Proton Service Chief and the Chief of Head and Neck Radiation Oncology. She's also the Associate Director of the Precision Interception and Prevention Program at Memorial, focused on creating and enhancing programs for early cancer detection and prevention. Dr. Lee is an internationally renowned academic physician whose research Prolific publications, lectures, and mentorship have influenced the practice of, practice of oncologists across the world, as we have learned from Dr. Lee how to elevate patient care through the integration of new technologies like IMRT and proton therapy in clinical practice. Dr. Lee has dedicated her practice and career to embracing technology, modernizing the practice of medicine, and advancing radiation oncology. She's also active in the Society of Immunotherapy for Cancer and is involved in multiple trials involving novel therapeutic agents and radiation. Her research focuses on developing novel strategies to personalize cancer treatment with the goal of improved tumor cure and quality of life after radiation treatment for head and neck cancer. She's the recipient of several NIH R01 grants funding groundbreaking research in designing and evaluating novel imaging metrics to guide clinical treatment decisions assessing biomarkers and biologic targeted therapies to personalized treatment, and establishing treatment guidelines for both established and emerging radiation technologies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee for Winship Graduates. Thank you so much for such a kind introduction. And um, it really is my uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so I will try to speak slowly, but then I may have to speed up because I have so much to tell you. I think it is so exciting to practice on college radiation college now. And I put this slide together because I think we'll add an error as quick as it is. Oh, sorry. I don't know if we can get rid of this, but I guess we can. So but anyway, um, I think we need to rethink radiation oncology the maximum tolerated dose concept is what we have done for about 50 years, right? This is the maximum we can give, so let's do it and then protect the normal tissue. But I really want to take us on a different way of thinking. How can we select the right patient, give the right dose, not an MPD, not an impaired case, but really um, genotypically selected, I'm going to give an example, and then how we can personalize therapy. I think we are very good on this side as radiation oncologists. Our physics is just very robust. We have all the tools and um, um, all the toys that we have. We're going to, um, at Memorial, we're going to get ethos very soon. We have MR Linux, we have Proton. I mean, you just have everything you need. Then that's great. But then what you notice is in the clinic, people still use the MTB concept, right? Everybody gets the same dose. And I think this is where we need to take biology and we act on the DNA, right? That's where radiation goes. How can we exploit this? This is underexploited. And then this is a picture of a microscope. You see the double Australian helix and the learning accelerator. So that is what I hope to take you on a journey using HPV uh, model and then another model. So these are my disclosure. I'm just on advisory boards. So two models, HPV-driven oral cancer cancer, um, which is the most common cancer in the United States, and lots of this, right? Lots of de-escalation trials, which I will go over with you. And then I want to end by looking at ATN Institute. This is a very exciting trial for me, um, which is hand cancer, but looking at the genetic defect and target of heart disease. HPV-positive cancer as a model, and I want to go through the current standard of care. Uh, some of you may not treat head neck cancer. I'm going to bring everybody on the same page, understanding what is the current landscape and what are the de-escalation trials. Many of them, unfortunately, have failed. And we're in, really actually in a crisis right now, I think, for head neck cancer. And then I want to talk about our personalized approach. So we all know this is KNA paper in uh, RTOG study in the New England Journal, where you look at the same oral pharyngeal cancer. If you're HPV positive, you just do better. If you're HPV negative, you do worse. So that's 
in itself a biomarker. When we looked at a memorial and we looked at our um, thousand patients, we noticed that oral pharyngeal cancer, which is this one, we have the least barrier compared to like oral cavity. So we concur that oral pharyngeal cancer should be better. And this is all comers. We didn't break it down by HP positive negative. And yet, if you look at the uh, five year, or at least three or five year, the control rate is like 95%. And so if you look at HPV positive, it's going to be better, around 95%. So that's the benchmark we hope we need to be at. Staging system changed since 2018. Actually, I hate the staging system. I think it's the worst thing that ever happened, even though I was part of it. And I think it's, <laughs> I think it's so bad that there are some talks among us that we need to go back because you have multiple lymph nodes, especially for de-escalation, right? If you have five lymph nodes versus one, and you want to de-escalate something to think about. So um, yeah, anyway, it is what it is. Um, so summary of the current treatment. Okay, what is the most effective current standard? It's seven weeks of radiation with cystine. High cystine is the most robust, but there's a weekly wait. Right, in the United States and the world. Surgery, whether laser, low back, or just regular tonsillectomy, radical surgery, followed by post op RT, typically 60 to 66, although this may change soon, so I will uh, give you some light, plus or minus chemotherapy. Those are the two accepted standards. Very high acute and late toxicities. And there are a lot of efforts. You go to any head and neck meeting whether surgery, radiation, not up. There will, and now even in dental society, there will be one section dedicated on de-escalation. And then I'm gonna talk about the failed attempts. And then there's so many ongoing trials right now. I try to summarize as much as I can. And then I think actually patients have so many options, it's very confusing. In the clinic, I spent a lot of time at clinic on Monday, it's like, going through everything, the rationale, and it's a lot of time that we spent. Patients are very smart, we go on the internet, right? We, Dr. Google is their doctor, right? So let's go through the de-escalation um, attempts. First, I want to talk about how, as a field in head neck cancer, we want to get rid of cisplatinum. Cisplatinum is the defective standard, very toxic, it's very wicked. We try very hard to replace it. So like everyone knows Fauna, it's, you know, for the newer resident, you do not know Cetuximab was the talk. Wherever you go, people talk about Cetuximab, but head neck cancer or any cancer. And because of this study, we we'll see it as a radio sensitizer by Fauna, published in the journal. 2006, um, FDA approved it for indication for head neck cancer. We also decided, well, if you don't want platinum, you know, these, these young people, they want platinum, we will give some tax plan. And it was very striking for me. I would have my failure at the council, and I remember this thing of the first failure of mine. That's very strange, but I guess biology is bad, right? It didn't work with the tax plan. And then you sort of have a second failure, you're like, okay, did I miss target? Go back and like, we didn't miss target anything. And then more and more failures, and then I had people coming, and then um, David Addison is an oncologist on Cleveland Clinic said, you know, you really should publish. And then that's what in, the impetus for us to put together this retrospective study. We went back and took all our platinum patients. We didn't do match care, we took everyone. Talking to statistician, that's the best way. Not match, because there's only so much you can match perfectly. And we took all the people that have cetuximab and striking difference in terms of local regional recurrence. And then disease response. Now, this is not just OPC. There's hypovariance layering in the oral array. And look at the disease response at all. In fact, it was so bad that um, people, my RTOG friends said, it just doesn't work as a memorial kittering. It works everywhere else, but that's no kittering. I'm not that right. So then we did our paper, uh, first paper. This paper was going to go to JCO, but there was so much money at stake that I got a letter from the uh, editorial. And then Board said, I'm sorry, we can't see the talk. We can't get in JCO because it's a lot of money. We're talking about a billion dollar industry, right? But 
Thank you for Jim Cox. You've got it to Red Journal. Even though it was in Red Journal, it was like the most downloaded that year paper. And also at ASCO, even though it was only the fourth downtown poster, because remember, this is a lot of money here. Even though it was really elegantly done, we had two statisticians, retrospective, really honing on the stats. We were so clean, worked very hard, whole team. But um, that poster, I, mean, I wasn't there that year, but my resident, Coucher was there. It was so many people were proud of to him. So people had thoughts, but still, this is what, 2009, I think it was. They do not want to believe it because that was the best drug, right? So then we kept going. We said, all right, so toxic patients are likely with carboplatin, even though you, you can't get platinum because of your odor toxicity or renal toxicity. And we found that so toxin was worse than carboplatin. Platinum carboplatin would be a very and even though patients are sick of it. Then people say, well, it's gotta be the HPV. So we went back, we last published this, that HPV positive did worse. And RTOG didn't do us a favor. They went back and said, well, in Bomber study, the HPV positive test B or first. A lot of conflict, and I just believe what our data show. And then we wrote an opinion to expand the JCL and say, let's write an opinion. So we did to them and say, caution. But still people wanted the level one evidence. And it was only until what? A decade later, finally, right? This is HPV positive, the lowest risk patient that should do well with Sotoxamab. It's worse than platinum. So no longer hear about Sotoxamab. You don't hear about it anymore. It's gone. And I felt redeemed. I was really like, I, I kept asking, and people wouldn't tell me the data until, you know, our teacher and not about the documents until the data until it's published. I mean, until it's known. And then um, it really, um, look at the curve separation. Remember, our curve separated more because we had flames and hypoflame. It isn't that we made the toxin worse because we overlaid our plot. Sorry, Dr. Lee, can you speak louder? People are um, having issues with audio. Oh, okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. Now, thank you. It isn't that, thank you. It isn't that we did worse. If you overlay our curve, it's exactly the bottom curve, right? So it's not like we made it worse, we made the platinum look better. So, this story is out, we cannot replace cis platinum, even for the low risk patient. In fact, platinum probably have a distant mess effect. And that is what the de-escalate study show, at least a high dose of platinum. So then cetuximab so didn't work. Now the way, right? Talk to resident nurse waves. Now the way this immunotherapy. God forbid you don't talk about immunotherapy. It is the current way. I wonder how long this wave will last. I think it's better than cetuximab, but I can tell you you're gonna see a series of negative studies, which I'm gonna show you some, right? So here, this was a this was a very disappointing trial job, but we designed this. It was preclinical data that showed um, that synergize enhances radiation and chemo. So logical, right? You have 70 gray with um, platinum. And I kept everything simple. So there's no criticism. 70 gray, high dose of cisplatinum. And then we simply added anti pd one of Villanet from Pfizer. We did a loading dose of one week before. And then one week after, we started chemo radiation and an adjuvant of one year of anti pd one right? And patients were being cured. We were double blinded. And I was like, that got to be an alpha. Bellomat, he's T4 big tumor. It turned out they were standard care. When we found the result, they had to blind everybody after the result was published. You can see there was a difference in the curve, very disappointing, even though not statistically significant. And then right now, this is a year that you want to look for a paper that we will submit very shortly. That I got Tim Chan, maybe we asked, working out why. And all the theories that are out there is wrong. I just want to tell you, there's, I can't tell you what the result is, but there were a lot of talk about, you can't treat the neck. And I'm thinking about for 40 years, we have treated the subclinical region. You are asking me to drop that, whereas in surgical literature, clear, the surgeon clear lymph nodes, and it's PET negative on imaging. So there's a lot of preclinical data on that. It looks very elegant, which I'll address that in a second. And then a lot of talk about, um, you know, um, um, 
BRT, you have to press BRT. Then I'm thinking you, you're taking 40 years of fractionated radiation, throw it out the window and change everything to SBRT like prostate. I don't think so in the head and neck, it's a big deal. So a lot of this theory, um, I think will be dispelled once you see this paper, hopefully uh, shortly in this year. It's a preclinical laboratory paper, just a small paper. Now, Javelin's study, everyone said anti-PDO1 is just a bad drug. What we need is PD1, which is pembrolizumab. And this is a keynote study, also negative. This, is, I mean, this paper should come out sometime this year. I was just at um, Barcelona with the first author, um, and they're going to submit it very soon. So you'll see this paper as well. Maybe the PD1 does a little better, right? But they broke it down with CPS4. Maybe that could be a biomarker. So stay tuned. But, and then what's really disappointing was Lauren Mills. This is now Dervilumab, which is anti pd Remember, this is the drug that got the indication for lung cancer Pacific trial, right? And Dervilumab was worse than subtaximab. And I told you guys earlier, subtaximab, how bad it is. So what's going on? Is there a, a antagonist effect? Something's going on, we don't know. But look at the curve. It's strikingly um, in favor of a drug that we actually don't like, which is subtaximab. And, um, and distant metastasis is no different. That makes sense, because PD-1 or pd one probably has the distant effect speaks for lung cancer, what is the pattern of their remaining distant? That is why, and the bar is easier to beat. Head and neck cancer, very hard to beat the bar. The standard is so good, right? You go back, it's about 70% overall survival. If you look at even, look at that, look at Javelin, right? You look at the control arm at um, two years, it's not 50% anymore. The dogma could be less focused, better supportive care, people are living longer. So to beat that is very hard. You need a lot of patients. What's in lung cancer is easy. Stage three, uh, beat lung cancer, don't do so well. So then you look at lower mill study. Then since, you know, it's not just a Javelin study, there are two REACH studies from Europe using anti pd one available, also negative. Also a little bit more failure in the pd one arm. And then there's also color study in cervical cancer. They use two years of adjuvant, um, I think it's pembrolizumab up here, and also negative. And then you have Pacific 2. My understanding is worse than Pacific 1. It hasn't been published yet because a lot of people tell me, I don't think I've seen a publication where concurrent, is, it didn't do better than sequential. So it tells you something about concurrent. So until further notice, I do not think we should do concurrent therapy with immunotherapy, unless you're on trial. You go, go back to look at the PFS on the Dervilumab study by Technic 004. These are the cis ineligible patients that Laura Mill um, um, conducted. You can see, look at how bad it is in PCP10 negative. So looking like this metaxamab curve that I had really bad with here platinum, but this is worse against metaxamab. And then what's striking to me here is look at the local regional failure. So now this speaks of radiation, okay? And look at the P16 positive RT and cetuximab, the failures here, but look at the DERBA, there's more failure. Another clue to tell us concurrent, not a good idea. It's probably a local issue. So then RTOG, you know, Suya, my friend, this is a really good study when it first started, uh, even though we didn't participate in it because we didn't believe in it. You know, and we were most worried about arm brain. Nevo, single agent map with escalated RT. We were very, very worried about this, so we didn't open. But there's 70 gray standard, I mean, escalated RT. So we made the control arm. This is very toxic, right? It's interesting when you design charge, you want to design something that makes sense. So I personally would have left it as standard care, standard fractionation. We don't do acceleration, but RTOG really likes it six days a week, BID on Friday. And then here, um, 60 grades, standard fractionation. We really wanted um, this arm to be positive, change to high doses platinum. And this arm is what was concerning for me, but it turned out this was negative, which as you know, this is very disappointing. 
we can go to 60 gray in an unselected manner, right? It didn't meet the specified non-inferiority. That's very concerning. I think our field is like going back to square one, 70 and um, with platinum. I thought 60 was going to be for sure positive, but I started getting worried because remember Memorial, we see a lot of patients from outside. And um, we saw, we ha I had at least two people from uh, Northern New York that failed 60 gray. And what I'm dealing with right now is bad failure. And I'm like, hmm, this is weird. So I actually talked to Sue, she's hurt too. But surprisingly, we haven't heard anything about Nebo, but I think it's because of the late uh, effect. I find it personally hard to believe arm three can be arm one. That would be very, very odd. That high dose is fine, that 70 gray is gonna be equivalent or inferior to Nebo single agent. So that's my own thing. But randomized study will tell us. And Lauren Mill has a similar study, all comers, platinum versus uh, pembrolizumab. So we'll know the story later. Uh, although Lauren thinks this study is not going to be possible. I always try to dig in information. Now, until further data, platinum remains the standard of care. Caution to combine IO with RT off trial. I know there are a lot of trials that were ongoing. Some people don't give it up. And I think that's why I say that there'll be a slew of negative studies coming out. So that's platinum number one. We can't get rid of platinum. So if we can't get rid of it, can we drop it? This is what Sue did, 60 gray plus platinum weekly cyst here versus RT, escalated RT. Okay. These studies are funny, right? If you look at head and neck history, these escalated RT versus chemo radiation happened that they were all negative, but it hasn't been done in HPV positive. So that's what we said, all right? HPV has been better, let's do this. Of course, it's negative. More failure in the patients that had escalated RT, right? Progression-free survival also was worse. So we can't drop platinum. And then um, Bishan, um, 60 gray is sort of like, then 60 gray, a lot of places, Bishan has elegant study done, single institution using 30 milligram per meter square, and even 180. The dog blood in head and neck is 200 minimum. So theirs was less, but they have great data, single institution, Alan Chen has 60 gray, so there's a lot of 60 gray out there, but now I don't think you can do 60 gray because the Mega said said it's worse. So it's almost unethical, right? And then, so going back to this, this is a problem. When this comes out, then I don't know how about all the 60 gray. I don't think it's, you can do that off trial. So you can't drop cisplatinum. The, the question is, you know, very sad after three decades of trial, platinum remains the standard. And the question really is, is it weekly or high dose? This is a very interesting, it's a thousand patients, it's gonna take 10 years to finish. People are so biased. And I heard, I wasn't at the last RTOG, but I heard there's already some weekly barriers, that's bad. So I, we are a high dose center. We are not weekly. Remember going back to de-escalate a study, distant metastasis free survival is improved with high dose platinum. So something to think about, I think the pattern here you for HPV driven cancer is distant, not local region. They generally do well if 70, right? Generally do very well. But that's why I still worry about crisis because now we're kind of stuck. I'm worried that 10 years later, I'd say when I'm about to retire, it's like 70 grade and high dose is platinum. And that's what we did for four decades, right? It's pretty sad actually. How about induction approach? Of course, medical oncologists, this is a study done by Barbara Burton's group, uh, RTOG 1308. Um, if you have induction, then you, you, if you have complete response, you can then just do um, the 54 gray right here, and then, or a salary RT if you didn't have complete response. Patients did very well. Excellent, when you select out the early stage patients do very well. But I'm not so sure this is the escalation. You just turn this patient into another three months of chemotherapy, right? This is now six months, well, five months of therapy. That doesn't stop the escalation. However, I think the T4 and 3 patient, they're not on any de escalation trial, something to think about that we can give de escalation. Shrink it down, consider de escalation. Give them a chance to have de escalated RT. How about surgery? Of course, we've been talking about robot surgery. This is ECOP 3311 by that. There is, and this study is very good. The numbers go, but go look at table numbers two or three. 
and look underneath the table since this publication the world more failure the relapse free survival for arm a which is worldwide alone is actually 89 percent uh, go look at it you can calculate it yourself um, because you could have a cutoff and then there's more since your publications so something to think about but i do think the 50 gray this may go to nccn so look for that we have things to do at 50 gray and we haven't seen it here i thought there was one possible one from it was that was great so we thought the intermediate patients would be good for you. So I think surgery can do something for our patients. But whatever you do, you don't want triple modality because they're going to have a lot of problems. How far can you go in mass work? Can you go down to 30 with the uh, docetaxel, BID, right? That's the uh, EMAS in Mayo Clinic. And but unfortunately, if you have ECV of the prevalent and two, you can't. It's worse, right? So you have to be very careful who you select to de escalate to 30. And of course, Alex Lim, the Roy trial, let's avoid the primary, right? That's another one that had a negative margin. But these are all single institution study, but at least they follow the standard dosing, right? Surgery. And so that's going on, and it's going to be very hard to resolve, and it's very hard to do another actually surgical gamma study. And then, of course, they will come up from Consist Bar, uh, from, uh, I can't remember now, anyway, from uh, Canada, where you can see that they did the randomized study of 60 gray chemo versus um, surgery, followed by radiation. And it was worse. They have more death in the surgical arm. And of course, the American surgeons say, well, some of your Canadian surgeons don't know how to operate, but come on. They all went to credentialing and look at the bleeding that's the same, the oratory one, two trial, the same as detox. Our surgeon, I think there is a role for surgery, but um, our center, we have this multi group conference every Thursday at 7 15. We do not single person decide. Unlike many other centers, you see the surgeon is like, I'm a robot. By the time the radiation call is here, it's like post op. We don't do that. It has to be presented. Everyone, that took a while, but it's very nice to hear surgeons will say, We want those great, which I'll tell you about our center. Okay, so try not to get modality patient selection key. I like this study. Look at a robot. Why don't we robot use NAPDX as a biomarker? If you have pre-surgery greater than 50, you did your surgery, you remove all diseases through robotic dissection, and then you have an indication for post-op RT. But if you're post-op NAPDX, two time points, you were very careful, two time points. Make sure there's no false positive or negative negative then we use the sort of plastic this is what i love about the study when, when we designed i was thinking why don't we follow plastic if your selfie dna is negative you observe and then when we observe we are getting serial map dx every three months and then mri we have a research mri we're very spoiled three tesla mri it's diagnostic quality you can use it to do patient to treat uh, to scan patient but if you're on study you can use it it's free um, basically, if you start having rising fat gas without clinical evidence of disease, then that's when you use that. Sort of like prostate rising PSA, right? And then the gross disease, we actually just amended this in 30 grade. Because we can't go above 30. I'm going to show you our data. We can't go above 30. It's very hard for us to go above 30 grade in our um, cohort we selected. And how about using our technology? I am at the proton surprise. Talk about proton right here. So proton, no question. I love the fact that the oral cavity is spare. There is no question about that, right? You guys see it as big jewelry. I treated about, I, I went back, I probably treated over almost 2,000 head neck patients from procure days to now. It's just a lot of patients, a lot of patients. And we looked at our OPC and we said, you know, basically no difference in the young, but you can see the curve. If we have breast cancer, I have no doubt in my mind there's an efficacy endpoint, but we can't prove any head neck cancer. I think proton has a harder hit. I've seen it. Patients I can't cure, like especially amyloid cystic carcinoma, these big giant, I can get rid of them. We can't do it with IMRT. So you see the curves, they're gonna separate, but I can't say see proof, but at least we can say toxicity is less, right? I think I don't have to tell this audience less acute toxicity. There is an ORN paper controversial. We put in the rebuttal because this was done by my dental group. There's a lot of issues, and 
that was my oversized silk when you guys write papers just i was so busy i wasn't paying attention what the dentist was doing but very careful when you write the papers as a learn for me as well that basically if your your name is going to be on a paper even though you're not a senior you have to be very careful but time is limited because you're so busy so choose who, which paper you want to be on uh, but it's not like i can't be on that paper so or and about protons i had to be but anyway we wrote a letter we thought it would just have published so uh, not rebuttal, like a letter of clarification. And so that would be good. Um, at least um, in our clinical series, we have uniform code, but we do not see more ORN. So that's good. Randomized studies go to have us deep brain um, study. We were going to shoot for ASCO this year, but events did not come in. We didn't come next year, right? You guys participated too, right? Did you participate? This is really good. Tim and I got so excited. I think I was in the Atlanta airport in transition talking to him like we're so excited with data i think it's going to be really good the only thing is the doses were so high but i, I understand we can't change the dose by right? 70 grade. so i had to when i would do when i was doing this study i had to go from a story to 6996 which is a, something that I, I don't use anymore so that's next year 2024. now one thing you can do i'll try i'm trying to preach this so i'm going to spend some time on this why give 54 grade or 60 grade something Dose, just like the residents now, there is no standard CTV dose. If you go back in the old days, it used to be some people gave 40, there's 50 gray, two Diera. And then when we went to IMRT, because we wanted to dose paint two gray to 70, we want to keep 1.8. That's where 63 came from, right? And then the 1.6, that's weird. That's very weird. Now it's like accepted, but it was very weird to do one point. Below 1.8 to 56, right? So look at the elevation. So I asked my colleagues, my friend, where was the randomized study to show you you need a 63 grade? None. But yeah, when I want to go down de escalating 30 all over Twitter, it's not like blah 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 blah. I'm like, come on, let's think about it. So all the studies done were RT alone. You look at the book lecture back then. 45 grades, RT alone. We're now chemo radiation, we sensitize. So 30 grade, this is what we do, 30 grade, two grade perfection. This is our de facto standard. We couldn't ethically do 30 grade subclinical in a non-protocol patient. So we actually got together with our legal team and explained there is no standard subclinical. And so she said, you know, we wrote a, a paper, Julian put together the pro paper to say, this is our standard. And since then, 2017, um, we this is our standard. Doesn't matter what stage, as long as your HPV passes, whether T4, N3, doesn't matter. All the subclinical region will only get two grade perfection to 30 grade. Then we have a cone down just to the GPD. Beautiful. We adapt. We have these sensitive tumors shrink. Then we shrink with the tumor. That goes to 70 grade, to 40 grade, two grade perfection. Toxicity is very low. Our paper came out, as you know, and there was a lot of Twitter noise. Um, and then hopefully, I really wanted to get this in NCCN. That's something that we want to do and help. Actually, to my surprise, even though a lot of people need to have randomized study, um, a lot of places already adopted. My friend, the Reagan brothers adopted, uh, Lauren Mills, like Nancy, I want to do this. People call me. I said, don't worry, just make sure your subclinical is truly subclinical. If you see any little bits of like little lymph nodes, remember HPV, it's not the big lymph nodes that fail, it's the little ones with a little pet activity, pay attention to them. You need to give 70 grade or at least 60 grade, do not do 30. So that's the same. Okay, this is our PRO. Look at our PRO, it's not bad. So really, our patients are not that toxic. I mean, that, 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 that much side effect. If I were to summarize, um, all current that I showed you six different ways including our 3070, gross tumors still use very high dose radiation and everyone gets the same. There was no, when you fail, you don't know why. HPV alone isn't enough. Smoking is not a good indicator. Smoking is good for survival, not for your local regional control. That was a paper that Brian O'Sullivan, when he retired, was supposed to write, but he just decided to retire. But no one will be using, uh, no one will be using uh, smoking for local regional, I can tell you. We all talk about it. It's all about survival. 
Okay, so for me, clinical research, the research that continues at the integrated level, like here's a biomarker, we get it. So what? That's good, that's important. But I'm more interested, in what can we do as a change for our patient as an integral biomarker? Take a biomarker and make a change. So this is where the reduction of oral brain tumor cancer 30, 30 rock trial came. And our, the question I asked is, are HPV disease the same? The answer is no. Look at the cell line, HPV positive cell line, the different cell lines are all HPV positive and HPV negative. They have the same survival curve. So it tells you there's a biology issue here. Some people are more sensitive, some, some cell lines are more sensitive, some are not as sensitive. So the three buckets, I think, for residents, this is a great paper, looking at hypoxia, DNA repair, or the immune response of duplicating um, um, uh, the radio sensitivity. Let's focus on hypoxia. I spend a lot of time in hypoxia. Hypoxia means low oxygen. There is no question it's a bad prognostic marker. Look at any disease, preclinical, animal, to human, clinical trials, multiple studies, institutions done throughout the world. It's bad. You have hypoxic, you will give you poorly. That's not a debate. It's three times more radio resistant. You can assess it non invasively. You can use old days, Epidor. You're not going to stick something's neck all the time to assess oxygen status. And that's only one time point, right? When you see that little area, whereas what you miss, whereas you use non invasive head imaging, like FDG, it's a tracer at my soul. And there are a lot of tracer, FASA, ISEP, copper. In the end, I felt the best one is f because it has been the most robust clinical data in human, safe, as well as the fact that it's um, pretty user-friendly and I don't go into that. It gives you a global picture. So we started this, I had a grant, and the reason we had to pick up the primaries is because the NIH was so conservative will not allow me to de-escalate to 60 grade. This is way, way back in 2005, I think it was, or six, seven or eight, I can't remember the date, that I had to take out the primary, period. And I, they didn't care about margin status, which is interesting, right? So then I can only de-escalate the lymph node because there's a salvage option. What if I'm wrong? I can use negative salvage. That's how I learned that. So that's why our studies always took out the primary. We first only de-escalated to 60 gray, and then we even did have under image guidance, and that's when I first had, not everything you see is tumor on imaging. This is, the red is the hypoxic region. The FPG is bigger than this. And the results were great. It was like 95%, um, it's up there, you can't see, but it was like 95% um, local regional control. Um, survival is like 100%, and then, but then, you know, in two, in 2023, de-escalate 60 is not that, that, is not sexy. Although now head neck oral is negative, maybe. But then, you know, the story goes on, we want to go lower. So another group in Europe talked about, you know, now I need to pay attention here. If you look at the HPV positive with another way of assessing hypoxia, if your hypoxia is low, they did very well, right? If your hypoxia is positive, hip one alpha is immunohistochemistry um, tissue, you probably don't want to de-escalate the ones that are HPV positive or hypoxic, right? So we knew we were on the right track. And then, then that's when I start asking, why does everyone have to be treated the same? Is everyone the same? No, not one size doesn't fit all. But how low can we de-escalate? I was in my office thinking about this. It's like this aha moment from God, you know, like um, I'm a Christian. I was a praying, so I was like, what do I do? 60 gray, I feel like still very toxic, how low, why 50, 40? Like, what is the rationale, I ask myself. But the first thing I say, it must be safe. Remember I told you 95% was my control rate. We are not willing, I wasn't willing to go below 95. I know if you look at Bishan Chera's data, great data, but they put the inferior boundary to like 80. I'm not accept. we can't accept that. That would be really, would be a failure in our, um, um, in our uh, minds. But then if you're gonna de-escalate, it must be meaningful. If you go to 60, 50 is a constrictor constraint, right? Parotid dose is still very, very toxic. And this is when I remember resonance. I always remember back to what you learned. Like this is Dr. Nigrel, found the 70s for anal cancer. Five of you, mitomycin C, 
cured about 95% of anal cancer with 30 grams. And then Shama Brian, my colleague, found this paper called Perez in um, Washu, RT alone. Remember at that time in 60s, 70s, they did pre op RT, a little bit dose and surgery. And they found RT alone, non selected, 20 to 30 day gave you 60% pathologic response. So we took this leap of faith. And the other thing, I wasn't willing to compromise with platinum. I didn't want to get rid of chemo because I knew chemo was the only weapon we had to help distance. This is before the de escalate study, right? And we said there's no way we want to get rid of chemo. So then the combination, and later on when we talk about biology, platinum makes sense for this disease on a DNA repair pathway with radiation. So we did this, we said, all right, 30 gray a week the leap of faith. We started in 2015. Remember the grant, I had to take up the primary. It's the way it is. We can't deviate from that. That's why the first iteration had to take up the primary. We didn't care about the margin status. It doesn't matter if you're positive. Just remove the gross disease from me. And it turned out to be my blessing. Sometimes you don't like it. We have tissue to understand. So actually, I really like this. All right, when I think back, we asked them to keep the lymph node. And then we did whole single tumors. We all go through all some of the data. No evidence, hypoxia, 30 gray. And you'll see that these patients still have blood stones. It takes time to resolve. We follow them monthly. We have a lot of follow-up. We have the MRI from you that Dr. Powell gave us as free research. So very nice image. And then mandatory neck dissection for the first iteration because I know if we publish this, people will say, well, you don't know the path to CR, right? So we had to do that. So the surgeons were begging me, they're like, what am I operating with the pet is negative? I said, just go in. I don't care what you do, just go in. We <laughs> <laughs> all smokers, we didn't care. We had a lot of paralysis, even financial access. We are three surgeons. Surgeons thought we were crazy. I was crazy. They would say the tumor, but you want me to take out the primary and leave the lymph node? You're crazy. But three of our surgeons, Dr. Shah is like really the guy of surgeon. He bought in. He's number two was him. He didn't do robot. And then Jay Boyle, Rich Wong, who's a current chief, they were my really, they believed in um, this concept. So first iteration. So it's very easy, right? You take out the tumor. And then if you have, here's the FDG. If you're hypoxic negative, so this is meaning well confused, 30 grit. If you are hypoxic positive baseline, but you convert it during treatment, it speaks up radio sensitivity. You're being oxygenated, right? There's a tumor, hypoxia region, all the cells are dying. So the inside is seeing oxygen. So you also got 30 gray. But if you're persistent hypoxia, see this yellow and this yellow, this is on 1840 microlinus or tracer. Then we said biology is bad. You need to treat to seven gray. It's a very simple concept. This is a nuclear medicine team. Night and day hypoxia. I don't think you guys can tell which one's 30, which one's 70. And this is our precision radiation on 30 watt trial, 19 patients. First, as a pilot concept. And then this is the algorithm. You can see that we started with 19. You can't see on the top, but like there were 15 that were de escalated. And then um, I'm going to go through this data with you. And it's 95% uh, control rate, which is covered by you know, that area. So, anyway. This is the path CR. Everyone responded. We have one person, this person. Um, this is another lesson for residents to know like we like, like Emma, we have many, many campuses. So we had, and I was very busy on my campus. The first person was in a regional site, and the person was supposed to have a second cycle of chemo, but the nurse there at Baskin Ridge, where you're gonna go, the nurse and the nurse like, oh, you're done with radiation, you're done with chemo, and no one caught it. Right? And then of course the person only had one cycle of chemo. So I think that's why he recurred. But anyway, we were able to salvage him, but it, it's not easy to salvage. That was patient number one. But um, patients, um, and since then we really have a, you know, we are looking, looking, looking. You have to be careful. In the end, it's my fault. It's the PI's fault. It's not anyone's fault. You have to be very on top of your patients. So here you can see everyone responded. And there were like these cells that were on its way to die. Our pathologist said, they were on their way to die, you know. So if you wait a little longer, they're probably dead, you know. So here, um, I'm going to go through the research part. No one will be back to clinic. What did we find? Volume was not a good predictor. Because look at week three, the lymph nodes stay out there. If you're going to use volume to de-escalate, you can't make a decision yet because it's still there. 
right? You can't stop the radiation. Two more volumes, you know, larger data set, uh, which I will go through, um, basically was not predicted. Then how about looking at selfie DNA? How do we get rid of this? Can we get rid of this? You guys can see it. Thank you. I should have done that. Sorry, because you can't see the top. So early selfie DNA correlates with um, um, poor, um, poorly with um, pathologic CR. That's what we think, right? But um, when we looked at that was a hypothesis, but when you go in there, it was all over the place. And you look at B. Shanchera's data, um, Oh, yeah, okay. If you look at Bishan Chair's data, it was it didn't clear until week four. But well, I need my decision in week two. I need to tell my planner, you don't need to go to seventh grade. You're done. You can't wait till week four, it's over, right? So it's noisy, you can see from their data. So we did our update. Also, we found that week two basically still 64% still have persistent hypoxia. So that's not a good biomarker. I want to de-escalate, I want to know, I want to tell my planner, don't go to 70 grade. So then how about diffusion weight image? We're moving to all the MRI, we just had a thousand image, had a team looking at perfusion, diffusion, kurtosis. Initially, we thought maybe hay trans perfusion might make a difference. This is our 19 patients. And then we looked at maybe microstructure, which is kurtosis, may make a difference. But in the updated uh, data, it's all negative, right? Tell ADC mean apparent diffusion coefficient for the diffusion weighted image was not predictive of uh, third grade or at least of um, hypoxia, and then kurtosis also was not. So those were not good mark, and hay trans was also not um, ACMRI. So then, um, so we said, all right, FISO is still the best biomarker, right? FISO is only the phenotype. Well, there's a genetic reason why these patients do better. So let's go in there. This is where you come into DNA repair. We know that we want to find a genetic basis for responders. We know that HPV oncoproteins target DNA damage, right? We know the DNA damage re um, um, pathway. And we know that E7, their oncoprotein targets RB1, and there's a, you have a defect in NH, which is oncomodulin joining. And radiation works on the NHEJ pathway, right? Mainly the cell kill um, degrades NHEJ. And then we know that platinum, the repair for platinum means homologous recombination, right? So DNA cross linker. So that's why platinum makes sense in this disease. And then because when you give a combination of RG and platinum, the tumor does not have to repair itself, right? Double hit. Then what it does is it goes on to this alternative end joining, which is very ever possible. When you go into DNA replication, it breaks, right? And then alternative end joining, error prone. So how can you measure this? So you can use mutational signature. Remember all that genomic sequencing? You can measure this. And to look at the insertion and deletions, you have to look at whole genome sequencing. And we found that the responders indeed have more um, in delts versus the non responders. It's not perfect, but at least we have some clue. This is based on our 19 patients. We have more patients later that we're currently working on. You can't get this from the whole exome sequencing. Even though this is great to understand, this is not practical in the clinic. We're not going to wait for whole genome sequencing results to come back, which takes a month with the study, right? So, FMISO is still a very good tool. And I really love the study that the responders had a less clonal look versus a very complex clonal um, the, um, driven tumor. This is more like an Acrofax signature. This is more an age-related signature. When we look at the responders to 30 versus the non-responder to 30. So that's the DNA story. That's ongoing work we have now. Many hundreds of patients that may be the US is looking up. So I don't have the results being done. Now let's see, quickly talking about immune response. Here, Ash is going to talk about, it's a great paper, Cancer Discovery, looking at how HPV and immunity are related. Highly recommend you to read this. Different pathways that affect. And what we wanted to do quickly is, you know, every T cell 
um, you have an antigen and then you have a T cell, antigen specific T cell response. So we want to know if that's really happening. So uh, generally, generally we think it's probably driven by the T cell, and then we want to map the T cell responses. And then we want to look at the antigen. So everything has a barcode and we want to match it. And this is very hard work to do, but Ash, Ash is trying to perfect the technique by looking at blood. We collect tons of blood. And here you can see the um, first step, you have to identify the candidate, which could be antigen. And then here's what I really like. We then find the right tetramer of T cell in the action. And then you do TCR sequencing to get a positive hit. And then is it maybe the T cell that's killing your tumor? So that's something that's ongoing work. Very exciting. This is also research. And uh, I mean, maybe in the future, if time permits it, this is better than Epimazole as a way to select patient for de escalation. And interesting, Linda Chen's papers are um, actually going to be accepted soon. That um, basically, when you look at this memory T cell, the patients that had recurrence had less of this memory T cell in the recurrent tumor. So the whole immunotherapy immune system is this box that we are really going into to figure out. A lot of work is being done in medical oncology world, which is doing radiation. That's why we collected all the samples. Now back to the clinic, I'm gonna go through with you. We no longer do the clarinet dissection. Remember, pilot study, primary, we grow back clarinet. We don't do that anymore, we use PET. Surgery to primary is still mandated. And remember, it's still NIH funded, so still have to follow. And also, when you change your variable, don't change too many at the same time. We took out the plan next dissection. That's the first variable we changed. We kept the primary surgery. You have this conference every surgeon bought on. If you come here, you'll see every Thursday, we talk about 30 grade. They love 30 grade more than robot. We five robot surgeons. We're very collect carefully selected. If we can't get it to Linda Chen's MAPDX trial, we will put 30 gray. And we have 158 patients. We were able to de escalate 128 patients. But the 80, so about 20% of patients not good for de escalation. You can see the results absolutely great. Um, 5%, remember I put you the 95 when I keep, we kept it. And then uh, we had. Um, the standard definitions, you have adjuvant neck with stair with the 140, that's considered package. The standard RTOG definition, so we used it with eight patients that needed a uh, salvage neck dissection. 27 <coughs> patients have high margin of eight. Our two-year local regional control is about 95%. And then we look at smoking. Then uh, we can de-escalate smoking. I, this is what I like. People that have greater than 10 pack here, as long as the FIs are negative, we can de-escalate. Those patients will never be on any de-escalation trials. And then for the patients that fail, an example, FDG positive, F minus on negative 30 gray, eight months later, I mean, this is four months negative, eight months later, we heard neck dissection. We don't always routinely give adjuvant radiation. Uh, this patient actually was supposed to, actually when he recurred, uh, he saw the opinion and the others, everyone's like, everyone, everyone was like, like SBRT, you're in trouble, everybody's in trouble. And he wanted Proton, but Proton wasn't ready yet. So I was like, all right, let's just keep imaging you. He's four years out. The biggest donor would uh, give us millions of dollars for the trial. Big believer. <laughs> um, he, 30 gray, never needed, uh, he had a neck dissection for salvage, never needed BRT. And really good friend. And then these are the reasons you can see. Um, the um, adjuvant therapy, not everyone had um, needed additional treatment. We, had, we did have one patient, one patient recurred at two years, positive ECE, now has margin, and we threw the kitchen sink at him. IORT 15 gray, 66 gray, chemo, everything, proton, and then he had a bad complication. Could be the proton, whether it was robust or not, I don't know, it could be whatever it is, present to robot, but after that, we don't do IORT, we just go straight to. Um, DRT, we need to. Two year progression free survival 94%. The one person that failed both local and distant. Distant was in there, actually, though, you know, got I'm radiating him out and it took a while to figure that out. He's looking great. So, um, he owns a restaurant or a bakery shop. He's the, the speaks of HP Dazen tumor did very well. Overall survival is 99%. We actually have one person that died in the seventh grade cohort due to his pulmonary embolus. So, they're not jumping the neck dissection. Look at this patient pre-treatment. This guy's from Florida. 
forget the number now. One month after the blue wow, I was like, oh my goodness, this has got to be the current sound. We're going to be in trouble. We're not going to be a salvage. And then we F and A negative. We never do a neck dissection without pathologic proof. It was all this fungal material, which is resolved on its own. Three months, four months. He's like, maybe two and a half years out now from Florida, from rehab. So don't always jump into neck dissection. Please tell your surgeon that. And daddy, you can see we have a little dip at three weeks. It goes up, we did ERT study, we have a lot. We, we just submitted the paper. I was a little disappointed. We submitted to our then Jeff patch the editor, sent out for review, only 10% of the patients to approve the papers go out to review. We had four reviewers. I mean, they really were serious, but one person like killed it. I don't know who that was. <laughs> 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 and then we out there, so now I have to put it a shoot for Lancet. I mean, the editor was interested, but like, it's a lot of work. I was thinking, not the thing I have to do, you know, like, I really, um, just, I really want the story out because I really think we're helping people. And look at the, look at the family, this is functional assessment now, functional assessment. There are no patients with moderate um, dysphagia. If you look at these um, studies, basically, um, patients always have some functional impairment, even though clinically they're fine. So we actually did object on people that were willing to come. This was really hard during COVID. Remember the trial was during COVID too. But COVID actually didn't stop patients. The reason I want to talk about COVID being a second. So these are all the side side effects. Mainly they were hematologic. And then, so we did this. This is the, the review. I hated this graph, but I loved it. Basically looking at our QRT related toxicity compared to the standard, it's night and day, right? And then they want to say, well, how about compared to 60 grade? But if you look at Su Young's study, the toxicity is 80%. So we still did very well. So anyway, um, here's the parotid dose. It makes sense. Our doses for parotid is low, right? Because we only gave 30 grade. Our starting point is low. And then this is financial uh, toxicity. That's right. Patients actually felt that better. You want to get to a um, high score of 40. And then patient resurvey, they themselves felt that financial they were less burden even after treatment. And then since that, that study closed, because of COVID, remember OR was down, so we had to open this study. We did not mandate there's no more surgery needed in the primary. And we finished this trial. We actually piloted in our alliance partner. We have similar about six failures, seven failures, so that 10 failure. And, and I wanted to say yes, no one comment. So we wanted to really do this outside of MSK. So we piloted this, we had a charter plane, a commercial plane, by the tracer from Memorial down to Miami. I wanted to see the longest stretch, right? Because you need to have a cyclotron. It's actually easy. It's like f miso is like FBG. It's like your blue apron. You go like Hello Fresh, delivered to you, but you need a kitchen to cook that blue apron material. Your kitchen is your cyclotron. And then you need to have that tag on the F18 and out comes the tracer. That's how easy it is. We buy the cartridge from GE. So I'm working at the FDA trying to get this approved so everyone can do it. Harper is from Connecticut. They finished enrolling. They want more spots. They have 10 patients total. I gave them so we had to help out um, giving them more spots. Next generation very quickly. Um, mandate core bias. You remember cohort B, there was no surgery. And then I was begging because I wanted tissue. Then no surgery, so we only had F and A, so we have no tissue on cohort B. So cohort C, this new study, now um, I mandated a core biopsy because I want to get tissue. The T3, T2, T3, especially T2 and zero, we started to say, you know what? Um, why should they not get on a trial? Because remember, we needed to have a lymph node, right? So now these patients were excluded and then our surgeons say, it doesn't make sense. You have a lower stage, you have to go to 70 gray. Standard RT alone. So, so now um, what I did for this trial is we just didn't treat subclinical nodal region, just treat GTV. And I did that for 50 patients. Our surgeons just like got so nervous. So we finished 50, we're back to treating the whole neck. But at least I have 50 patients of good blood. We collected so much blood. I'm going to really find out does it really make a difference. And then this concept is from University of Chicago, right? They found this for 70 gray. So treating the nodal is not, and then of course Sana's um, preclinical data and also human where she just treated um, using SPRT, right? 
pretty good. So we're going to have a lot of love. We're going to see if that's really, um, we can find the same finding asana. We don't have any other time. Okay, so here, then um, we have we have to act three new cobra because now our meta is saying, well, my patient can't get platinum, can't get carbo five view. We want to give carbo tax so Can we do that? So then we added that cohort. So these are really sick patients, elderly. And that makes sense. They are the ones that need the 30 grade. They're very old, right? And then the T3, T4, we're getting induction to. So that these are pilot study and the T2, T3, N0, we're going to just treat them next. Uh, it's a lot of men. So can you, 30 and 70 is very binary. Uh, how about 40? How about 50? How about 60? We need to separate out the primary and the next. So this is what I think should be the future. Separate out the primary from the next using a lot of next generation sequencing. AI, this is where it comes in and where we can truly personalize. This is your genotype or phenotype, you get 40. This is what you have to get 10th grade. And this is a lot of work done behind the scenes. So physician, standard care, I'm gonna end by talking about this. I'm gonna, before I retire, make it the standard care. I spoke to FBI twice now and we are going back. They want me to run a 30 million study. Who has 30 million? We're not a pharmaceutical company. FMI is also all patent. Cardinal Health is generated. It's not interested to fund. Met with NCI, Energy Accounts, we're interested, but cost is the issue. So we are asking for it as like a expanded access protocol so that we can actually um, drive down the cost so that anybody can do it and probably submit to insurance. So then we're gonna pilot um, and no vector genealogy cartridge. We present energy oncology. I'm gonna go back once I solve the FDA issue and then make an energy oncology study and compare it to the standard. You need to centralize, which we did. We have a paper coming out, find it by five new food medicine doctors. The leading is kappa is 0.9, which is really good. And then this is the pathway. I used to think this is gonna be 60 gray and it's gonna be 70 gray, unfortunately. Okay. I don't have time for this, but I did want to tell you, you can talk about, you can use ATM mutant tumor to genotypically select. And we are actually doing a trial using ATR inhibitor with 20 grade in ATM mutant tumor hand cancer. So that's the concept I want to bring in. Hope you understand that. I use HPV as a model because that's probably the first cancer we're doing this on, right? Nobody else is doing it. And we got to inch into every other cancer. It would take time, but I do, I do think the young residents, before you guys retire, personalization has to be there. And then future is going to be all AI, right? All the AI stuff, and then it will be interesting to see what happens. So I do want to acknowledge all my patients. Oh yeah, this is really neat, look. Four grade times two, he wiped out this angiosarcoma because he's ATM mutant. So I just wanted to show you that, that's that. Okay, so then this is the study. Transform, we want to transform the practice of radiation therapy from this blunt tool to a biology information driven targeted approach. Think radiation as a target. Get a biomarker, we target accordingly. Our doses can only go up and down. It's not like chemotherapy or a variety of drugs, but we can go up or down. This is um, where it cannot be done without MT behind the scene. Um, anyway, thank you for your attention. Questions. Thank you, Dr. Lee. For those uh, on the uh, Zoom, please submit any questions of interest in the Q and A. Uh, we have one from Dr. Lawson, Dr. David Lawson. In melanoma, there's recent data that neoadjuvant immunotherapy is superior to adjuvant immunotherapy, and many of us think that's because the draining lymph nodes are left in place. Do you think that neoadjuvant immunotherapy might have a role in head and neck cancer despite the otherwise disappointing results? Yeah, that's a very good question. We're running that study, um, Merck study 689, two cycles of pembrolizumab um, followed by surgery versus standard care surgery and radiation. So we will know that's a surgical study. I was just at the Merck Apple at um, Barcelona last weekend. Even though we're thinking pre, uh, pre apple pre um, radiation, um, there's now seem to be a shift. I um, the aging process is more of a sequence of adjuvant. Do your radiation first, then um, adjuvant. So um, I don't know the answer, but um, 
one thing I know who was selected eight grade times three by RT plus immunotherapy. Um, I think it's pretty toxic, I think. And also, I'm not so sure about the long term, so I may need the surgery. So, if we were to do it, can we omit the surgery? Then I would do radiation first followed by aspirin. And we have those studies that are done. Um, hopefully, it will come out. Um, but remember, I said the story doesn't end. Even though concurrent chemo radiation is bad, okay, we know that. But remember, I told you to look out for this paper. I think we probably found the reason. It is something that nobody thought about. And Tim Chan, you know, Tim Chan's very smart. He found some new signatures that people will know, and that will be user friendly. That will change, I think, how we think, how we combine the two. But great thought, though. Uh, uh, studies are being done, we'll know the answer. Could, could I ask um, for your T4 patients where you in the current protocol start with a neoadjuvant chemotherapy approach, what criteria do you use to select those who may be eligible for the 30 rocker paradigm? Thank you for asking that question. So remember we went from, I finished the first cohort and I went to 22215, that's a new one where I did 50 patients, right? that's still ongoing trial. Um, I wanna tell the story so that I got really bold. We got really bold, we were like, you should, you have to, at one point we have, we, in 2225, in with the four months, we enrolled like four or five months, we enrolled 50 patients. People were flying all over the world. I just want you to know, people are emailing me, like, I want to come, I want to come. They were bored this and then you should And then I wasn't QAing every scan before, right? So there were these people that were T2, borderline T4, right? What's T4? Anterior extension to the tuck, right? So we went to them with two people that failed, both of them when you look back, they were clear T4. We just didn't catch it. We're like, the pet, uh, well, okay, let's give this person a chance. So those are the patients I think we should go on the induction route. So we did have one patient I saw two weeks ago. This was a massive T4. Like, I mean, like the entire time, right? So, so that probably I won't do yet. Our pilot, we want to start with those T2 that goes to T4, that invades the tongue, clear T4, you know, maybe like a third way through or something. Let's see what those response. The criteria to go the 30 rock pathway, you have to convert at the induction from a T4 or T3, T3 is easy, right? It's greater than 0.9 or so, down to at least a T1, T2, and you have to be F myself negative. And we have three time points of F myself pre induction, post induction, and two weeks into induction. But by the way, the current FMISO protocol, we only do one time point, which is in week two, because all the decisions are being made at week two, so we don't repeat it. But with these new cohorts, we're doing one, because we just don't know, is the induction um, pathway going to work? So the answer is, um, I won't do the really massive T4, but all T4s are going to go out there, because yeah, they also deserve a chance for 30 quick. Oh, well, no, right? <laughs> Other question? I have a question. <clears throat> so you, you're choking for de-escalation, right? Is that because of the um, uh, acquired radio resistance? That's, that's question number one. Question number two, so you mentioned um, you want to use genome um, sequencing to check if it is double uh, brand as, uh, as a strike, how, did, how expensive that is. I think it's very cheap to do the blood to check if it is immunotherapy works, right? Yeah, so that's right. So we have so many different ways, which is the best, but yes, the whole genome sequencing does cost a lot. Even if you have the money, it takes a long time, right? Because you can't get it on the exome sequence. You need the whole genome to look for the indels for the genomic uh, DNA repair defects. So um, that's, to me, that's more academic to understand. Um, DNA repair, I think, is going to win. Now, immunotherapy, the T cell, the active T, uh, T cell reactive to the antigen. I don't know the answer. Um, that's also technically very challenging. We will, we will find out through the blood. So I don't have those answers. Um, but that's ongoing work right now. Remember, those, um, the one thing, the biggest thing that we did for the trial, the two cohorts, we collected a lot of tissue. Cohort A, we, everyone mandated a surgery. So a lot of tissue, 158, right? Cohort B, no surgery. So I had no tissue there. But um, both studies had tons of blood at every time, like pre-treatment, you know, week two, and I think sometimes at week four, when we had more money, I added a couple of uh, blood, but we didn't have money to call back. 
So that's the ongoing work. About it, the desistant, is it acquired? I think it's just inherent. I think it's inherent. I don't, I'm not so sure it's acquired. Um, that, um, but if it's inherent, why 30 and 70 grade make a difference? Why does it make a difference? Um, I'm not clear the question. So acquire means that you're, you're going to get this persistence. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's inherent. Yeah. Any other questions? So, yeah. so you have treated for like 20,000 for computation to see. Uh, so from your experience, have you seen like uh, there are many uh, replants for for time. So does this replant timeline, like how many times or how much days do the replant affect your patient like, uh, outcome, the prime the tumor and the toxicity? Great question. I, first, I want to ask you, how many replants do you guys do? I think uh, probably 30 to 40. Yeah. Right. And how, how many time frames? How many time frames? Yeah, think, seven week of radiation. Right. We, I think we, uh, we do QACT every uh, other week. And sometimes the first week, and then sometimes the week, two weeks. Yeah. Um, I see, uh, we see, um, there are quite some patients did two replants. That's great. How long does it take replant? Let's say I want to do replant today. How That's long a good does it question take? for it. <laughs> Too long. <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes. Yeah, so the reason I ask this is um, that's what in the ideal world, we do QACP weekly, but for me to replant the quickest high goal, as Andy said, it has to be like seven or eight days. I mean, to me, it's just too slow. Um, so I think in the real world, the more you do, if we can speed up, it's going to be a different from a patient outcome in terms of toxicity, because especially these HPV tumor, they shrink very fast. And I think some of the ORM we saw, very interesting. Um, there was one guy, this, was, well, this wasn't really an IMPT, it was passive scattering or active scanning. But the ORM was anterior to our target. And you can say maybe it's, we weren't really ranging into the mandible. But I think it's because the patient's anatomy changed. And we look at a plan and say it's okay. But it is that subtle difference that makes a difference ultimately in the patient. So I think the planning is important. Now, their mom, my friend, and Mayo Clinic say that they can be planned really fast, like within a week. So I went back to my team at NYPC and they said they can't. So I don't understand them. All I know is the faster, the better. If we can do weekly, that would be super ideal, super ideal. So what I did instead, okay, logistically, I'll tell you inside this. We remember we do 30 gray, then 40 gray, right? So the 30 gray, we said, you know what? It's just everything. So if you treat a little bit more, you know, it would be nice to be planned, but it's just not enough time. And then by the time you go to 40 grade, it's just TTD only, right? So that's the best way to de-escalate because your dose is low, right? You just only give 30 grade subclinical. And then um, the, um, um, we sometimes would be planned and I would have to ask, but nobody, nobody can turn around the plan within like a couple of days. For some reason, it has to take like a week. Um, it just takes time with all the QA stuff, I think. Um, but I think we can get there. We can get through faster. So look at IMRT, you know, we need to be faster, right? And that's what ethos, right? Ethos is coming daily replanning or MR Linux. I did a whole bunch of MR Linux on Tuesday. And it will be interesting to see Proton Plan versus ethos versus IM, MR Linux, which one is uh, best in terms of toxicity. I suspect, um, and I, I suspect the fact that you can replan daily is going to be the best. It's going to trump, given the same dose, trump the proton. But it's too long on the table, right? And then I guess like BTS takes like 40 minutes, 50 minutes. So there's that trade off. So like I bought a patient, I gave no margin. I said, this is their proton, I'm going to treat with MR Linux. That's what I did on Tuesday. And I gave zero margin because it's right next to the orbit. So I think only MR Linux can do that. Proton can do that. But great, great question, though. I, I bet the physicists, please, faster. 
<laughs> Do you have, I mean, so when you talk about like uh, for your patients who are hypoxic at the 30 gray mark, that you reduce the margins and you just treat the residual gross tumor at that point, do you have concern that if it has shrunk a little bit, there's microscopic disease, particularly with protons, that you're giving almost no dose? No, I, I actually a great question. I think I used to, I used to be like, you know, we need to do the pre-chemo volume, we need to do the original GPV, but I think I think we over-treat, especially in Utah tumor. Um, right now, I, I don't. And maybe if they invade the oral tongue, I wouldn't, because salvage, I think about salvage, right? But if it's air, uh, if it's neck, I definitely shrink it because we have salvage neck dissection. And nasal pharynx, we actually did this consensus statement that we felt in the skull base we can't, but everywhere else we can. So um, that you can shrink your margin. I think um, I, I think our doses are too high. I actually think we don't really need to do um, even thirty gray. I think we can go down to twenty or ten. But those studies are very hard to do. Thirty, uh, thirty. Believe it or not, for thirty gray people still complain. It's taste. It's taste. I mean, I have some 30 gray patients at um, Proton 2, but they still complain about taste because Proton did not solve taste, at least not in my population. Taste is the number one problem, you know. And as you talk to the food industry, I was like, what can we do? Which buzz? And they're like, well, how, how can we help? And, but it's just something weird, right? Proton can solve that. Oh, but for you, there's some veg uh, poop. Well, uh, I think that the regular uh, at the says something that's a magic poop. You see, yes, magic proof, I think oh. she called it. I meant she um, talked about like using a fruit. <laughs> magic proof. Yeah. I can talk to Sue. I'm like, what magic proof? I'm going to meet with her. So, I'll be, yeah. so you had mentioned like paying attention to smite, like really small lymph nodes with minor pet activity. How often do you find yourself, like compared to 10 years ago, um, you know, calling those like, you know, maybe gross disease versus what you just would have included in like a standard dose of clinical volume? We always did. I always did. So okay. um, you can, because we, we also saw these little lymph nodes, especially, you know, they do little lymph if there's any activity, because we have a PET CT simulation, we always gave, I mean, maybe this overkill, we always gave 70 gray, even before when we were doing our 6996, or when we did our, we did this 212 for a decade, right? And we stopped. Then we did the 6054. 54 was our subclinical with the 10 gray boost. And then we always did, um, we always included them. It wasn't because we were down to 30 that we were more worried. Because they fail in these regions. It's the tiny little lump nodes. And Julian talked about it. There was a the person that failed in her paper, the one person that failed. When we look back, we presented a tumor board, there was definitely connectivity and there was definitely G2 there, but it was minor. And, but it was adjacent to another quantum lymph node. So um, the radiation policy decided not to target it by these immediate mass radiation. Since that paper, we treat about like, 600 patients now, I can't remember. Um, I had one patient, this is a true subclinical failure. He it was on the control level, it was a T4 tumor, tumor, control level, low levels, level four, pet stone cold, and MRI, nothing. And, and he had a three week break because of COVID. So I wonder if it's the COVID um, that, you know, the break, but I don't know, but it was interesting. It was a proton patient and I've learned a lot. So when you're doing the weekly gray CT, you know, I was so focused on the GTV, the lymph node. I didn't look at that controlado low line level uh, four, but that lymph node was there and it's there. And I'm like, I didn't even think about it because when I go back, I'm like, like, oh, it was there. So that may be the acquired resistant one. That's the only one I know that was completely soft, five millimeter, six millimeter, and then it grew. And that got 30 gray, which was very, very interesting to me. So we went back, we had to sell the chip. That was the only one. That's true subclinical failure. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. We look forward to spending more of the day with you, but uh, for purposes of the grand rounds, I think we'll, we'll uh, in, in this part component of the morning. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank much. you.